This is the Business Edition with me, Jamie Robertson. Re-elected, Sepp Blatter promises to restore the reputation of a governing body of world football. I'm not perfect. Nobody is perfect. But we will do a good job together, I'm sure. So uh, I thank you so much. I thank you for the trust and confidence. Trust and confidence. Together we go. Let's go, FIFA. I want to thank in particular all of the, those of you who are brave enough uh, to support me. Um, but having said that, I'll be with, uh, with, with you from the race. Um, so thank you all very much, and I wish you the best of luck for the future. Thank you. So Prince Ami Ben Al Hussein withdraws, and that leaves Mr. Blatter to begin a fifth term as FIFA president, despite the corruption scandal that has engulfed the organization this week. In other news, figures from America, Brazil and India show the painfully slow pace of economic growth. And Google reveals its latest bag of tricks to make our lives more convenient, more efficient and more, well, tied to Google. No small achievement also for the designer at South Africa's Soweto Fashion Week, meeting demand from plus-sized men. Hello and welcome. So, Sepp Blatter has been re-elected as FIFA's president for a fifth term. Despite being at the helm during one of the biggest corruption scandals to rock world football, he had resisted calls to stand aside after senior figures within the organisation were arrested as part of an investigation into bribery and fraud. What those allegations are, we'll be looking at shortly. His rival for the post is Jordan's Prince Ali bin Al Hussein, stepped out of the race for the presidency after failing to win a significant number of votes from FIFA's 209 delegates in the first ballot. Well, let's hear now what Mr Blatter had to say then. Well, FIFA's sponsors have begun their reactions following on from Mr Blatter's re-election. Coca-Cola is one of the big ones. It said FIFA must now seize the opportunity to begin winning back the trust it has lost. The firm said it urges FIFA to take concrete actions to fully address all of the issues that have been raised in a swift and transparent manner. When asked for their reaction to the re-election of Blatter, Adidas released the following statement. As stated before, we expect FIFA to continue to establish and follow transparent, compliant standards in everything they do. McDonald's, that's, this is what it said, our expectation is that FIFA will now act quickly, decisively and transparently to restore its reputation for both the good of the game and for fans worldwide who expect nothing less. The world expects concrete actions and so do we. Investigations, though, continue apace by the FBI and the Swiss authorities into the awarding of the 2018 and 2022 World Cups. Philip Norton's been looking at where those investigations now might go. Back in charge of world football, despite being at the centre of a storm over corruption allegations. Sepp Blatter didn't secure the FIFA presidency with a two-thirds majority. But when his only challenger, Prince Ali of Jordan, pulled out of voting, a fifth term was certain. It's despite huge controversy. When police swooped on both sides of the Atlantic early on Wednesday morning, it set the ball rolling on the biggest scandal ever to hit world football. That the FBI is behind the arrests is telling. Serious international crimes involving vast amounts of money, bribes, fraud, and money laundering. Today, the Serious Fraud Office said it too is looking at material relating to FIFA corruption allegations. Prime Minister David Cameron has been among those calling for Sepp Blatter to go. You cannot have accusations of corruption at this level and on this scale in this organisation and pretend that the person currently leading it is the right person to take it forward. That cannot be the case. Frankly, what we've seen is the ugly side of the beautiful game, and he should go. There are two separate investigations underway. While the American inquiry focuses on the financial side, Swiss prosecutors are looking into the bidding process for the World Cup tournaments in 2018 in Russia and 2022 in Qatar. There's potentially two big lateral actions that could happen. Uh, countries that were unsuccessful with their bids 
um, who will talk about a corrupt tender process um, that, that was unfair on them. And the second thing will be uh, sports broadcasters who haven't got the broadcast rights to the particular mm. tournaments that are the subject of this corruption. But authorities say this is just the start. The FBI alleges widespread corruption at CONCACAF, football's governing body in North and Central America. They've arrested seven officials at their hotel in Switzerland. It claims corruption totalling $150 million over 21 years through marketing contracts for tournaments and the bidding process for South Africa's 2010 World Cup. They also allege corruption over Sepp Blatter's previous election as FIFA's boss. It's put the world's focus on Mr Blatter, with pressure from prime ministers to multinational companies and even the United Nations. But while the man with friends in high places has retained his title, Swiss authorities say he could still yet be questioned himself as the investigation into corruption within his organisation continues. Philip Norton, BBC News. I'm joined by Dr John Glenn, who's a senior lecturer in economics at Cranfield School of Management, and he's also a football finance specialist. Um, can we just go back to the allegations? There are these people who've been arrested, and allegations swarming around. What are the kind of scams they're looking into, they think might have been going on? As I say, nothing has been proved, nothing has been... Uh, 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 no-one has been convicted, no-one has uh, um, uh, been sent to jail yet. We're just talking allegations. OK, well, the allegations uh, in North America, Central America and South, South America are that £150 million of bribes and or kickbacks have been paid since 1991. So how have these been received? You have FIFA, which has the marketing rights and the TV rights uh, to the football game globally. They sell those rights via sports marketing companies. They do not sell them directly to the TV companies or, or to, to people who want to use them. You've talked about Adidas or whoever. These sports marketing companies have paid bribes, it is alleged, or have given kickbacks to FIFA in order to maintain their monopoly over those rights, which they then sell on to the broadcasting companies. That's what's been suggested is happening uh, in the Americas to the tune of about 150 million. Then we come to the issue of the 2018 World Cup and a 2020 World Cup, and the allegation is that there may have been bribes to secure uh, those competitions, and that is what the Swiss authorities are looking at. Why has it taken so long? Because actually, also the allegations about the 2010 uh, 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 World Cup as well, and there are allegations going right back into the 1990s, and yet it's just taken all this time for them to come out with any kind of charges. Why? Well, one might argue in Switzerland that, that a key thing that's happening, it's a very, very technical point, is that people who now run sports organisations can be defined as politically exposed persons. This is a regulation within banking to protect the banking system from appropriation of funds, primarily by politicians, it has been the historical case. Now, because sports bodies can now be defined as politically exposed persons, these people's bank accounts can be looked at in much greater detail. So the powers of the Swiss authorities to investigate are much greater than they have been in the past. And it, it, just, is it that reason? That power to be able to investigate that might mean that FIFA will clean up its act in the coming months and years, rather than necessarily any pressure which politicians and, and, and business can put on them. Yeah, more... Uh, well, no, there will be pressure from politicians, there will be pressure from business, and we've talked about uh, the big sponsors uh, of football globally. They will undoubtedly want FIFA to be seen to be a compliant business. They do not want to be associated uh, with corruption, bribery, uh, etc. So there will be pressure from business, there will be pressure from politicians. We've heard politicians speak in the piece uh, before. But uh, it has to be the case that FIFA has to clean its act up. It has to be seen as a body uh, which is running football in a compliant, in a transparent manner. OK, fascinating stuff. Dr John Glenn, thank you very much indeed.
Well, we always knew the growth numbers out today were going to be pretty uninspiring. No prizes for predicting. Greece's economy started shrinking again in the first three months of the year. The Swiss economy did too, consequence of its shock floating of its currency, you may remember, back in January. Uh, more worrying, the US economy was contracting at a 0.7% annualised pace for that first three-month period of the year. Brazil ended the first quarter 0.2% smaller than it started it. The economy, that is, rather than the country. Better news from India, but as Yogita Lamai will now explain, well, I'll explain in a second. The numbers are a little bit suspect. First, let's go to Samira Hussein is in New York. Uh, sh uh, what, what, what are the numbers and, 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 and what are they pointing to? So you'll remember that about a month ago, we got the first version of the GDP numbers, which showed that the economy only grew by about 0.2%. Not very good numbers at all. But as we started seeing some of the sort of tail end of the data coming in, as we heard today, it showed that the economy didn't even grow at all. It shrank by 0.7 percent. And there's a lot of factors that went into that and some that we've already talked about. You know, the low cost of fuel, the fact that people aren't, that businesses aren't drilling as much, uh, the high cost of the U.S. dollar, the really terrible weather. But what's really changed and why we see such a big revision is that the uh, trade gap was much higher than what was initially reported. So a bigger impact by that West Coast ports um, dispute um, that really had an effect on the overall GDP for the U.S. So, so, so if you've got a you're shrinking economy, I would imagine investors are throwing their hands in the air and running for the hills. <laughs> well, it wasn't totally unexpected. You know, once we saw that 0.2% growth number last month, um, economists had already sort of gotten used to the idea that, in fact, we probably are going to see a contraction in the economy. That is, that the economy actually shrank. So investors weren't totally taken by surprise. And so what they're doing now is sort of, you know, looking forward. Because, as you know, Jamie, the challenge with these GDP numbers is it's really backwards looking. It's looking at, you know, the first three months of this year. So that's January, February, and March. And we're already in May, almost June. So a lot of investors are looking forward to the uh, jobs report next week. Okay, Samira, thanks very much indeed. Samira Hussain there. Uh, we'll get on to India as promised in a second, but first we're going to go to Brazil because the world's seventh largest economy, that is Brazil, contracted by 0.2%. Daniel Alice joins us now from Sao Paulo. Uh, Daniel, why? Well, what's gone wrong with an economy that a few years ago was absolutely booming and has crashed almost like no, no other developing economy, no other major developing economy? Well, Brazil is going through a period of adjustment, and it's partly driven by its own government. Basically, the government has been cutting a lot of spending and going towards austerity measures. This is an attempt to get Brazil growing, not in 2015, but in 2016 and 2017. So far, the news have been pretty bad, so not 0.2% not down this quarter, and things will get even worse uh, throughout the year. The Brazilian government is actually expecting a contraction of 1.2% this year, which would be the worst uh, contraction in GDP since 1990, so that's 25 years ago. Can Jill Marosef, the uh, president, can she survive the kind of pressure? She's under a lot of pressure for corruption scandals. She's under a lot of pressure for the economic performance and the austerity measures. Is she going to be able to weather this particular political storm? Well, politically, she has two challenges that she's facing. One is Congress, which is an immediate challenge, and she's having a sort of a mixed record. She's getting much most of her economic plan approved by the Congress, but she's also been defeated in other instances. But the other challenge is with voters. Uh, for uh, for her fortunate, uh, for her luck, um, this will only be judged so three, four years from now in 2018 when Brazil will have new elections. She just began her second mandate right now. OK, Daniel Gallus, thanks very much indeed for that. We say the best for last, that's India. The numbers there, as I said earlier, are pretty good, 7.5%. This is annualised growth, but only for the first quarter of the year. And that means it's growing faster than China. The first time it's done that since the 1990s. Yogita LeMay reports now from Mumbai on that number and also on others that cover the whole of last year, 14 to 15. Here in India, the economy has grown by 7.3% from April 2014 to March 2015. And official data suggests that's because of an improvement in mining and manufacturing activity. 
on the face of it, this might seem like a drastic change from the 4.7% that we had seen a year earlier. But there is a fair amount of skepticism about how these numbers have been calculated. In the past year, the government has changed the method that it uses to calculate GDP data. One more reason why questions are being asked is because other data that's released through the year doesn't seem to support this GDP growth number. Uh, for example, industrial activity as well as exports have picked up in the past year, but not to the extent that the GDP growth number reflects. Nevertheless, this does come in a week that Narendra Modi finishes one year in power as India's Prime Minister. His big promise during the election was economic revival for the country, and if the numbers are to be believed, the country does seem to be on that path. However, the government would like to see investments pouring in. At the moment, it's more like a trickle, and that's what's really needed if India wants to stay on the fast track. Other news. Mohamedou Bahari has been sworn in as the new president of Nigeria. It is the first time in Nigeria's history that there has been a peaceful transition of power between two democratically elected politicians. Mr. Bahari defeated Goodluck Jonathan in March's elections. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for a suicide bomb attack on a Shia mosque in Saudi Arabia. It killed four people. It happened in the eastern city of Dammam, home to most of the country's Shia minority. Exactly one week ago, the group attacked another Shia mosque in the region, killing 20. Stay with us on BBC News, still to come. One man spots a really big gap in the market in South African fashion. Clothes for plus-sized men. In the biggest international sporting spectacle ever seen, up to 30 million people have taken part in sponsored athletics events to aid famine relief in Africa. The first of what the makers of Star Wars hope will be thousands of queues started forming at 7am. Taunting which led to scuffles, scuffles to fighting, fighting to full-scale riot, as the Liverpool fans broke out of their area and into the Juventus enclosure. The Belgian police had lost control. The whole world who will mourn the tragic death of Mr. Nehru today. He was the father of the Indian people from the day of independence. The Oprah Winfrey Show comes to an end after 25 years and more than 4,500 episodes. The chat show has made her one of the richest people on the planet. Jerry Halliwell, otherwise known as Ginger Spice, has announced she's left the Spice Girls. <laughs> I don't believe it. She's the one with the bounce, the go, girl power, not Jerry. Why? This is the Business Edition. I'm Jamie Robertson. Google has come up with a whole new bag of tricks at its annual developers conference in San Francisco and it hopes it's going to lure in customers into, well, effectively running their lives on Google. It's announced updates to its Android mobile operating system and the way that Google now searches. It's going to give users greater control over their privacy settings. It's going to introduce a new smart wallet service. It's going to be called Android Pay rather than Android Wallet. It's also unveiled a new photo and video storage app, which apparently is going to offer unlimited free storage. And as well, it's going to have updated versions of its cardboard virtual reality headset. The BBC's North America technology correspondent Richard Taylor gives more details on these highlights in the show in San Francisco. Well, it was a hugely discursive two-hour-long keynote covering advances in many of Google's ever-expanding product line. The major one, of course, being Android, used by over one billion people now. 80% of the smartphones around the world do use Android. And today, Google announced Android M, a code name for its new operating system, which will be out later this year. Android M featuring a number of improvements, everything from a revised payment system through the phone, now called Android Pay, as well as better fingerprint authentication moves in some ways which do bring it up to speed with Apple's operating system. There's also better battery management on Android M. Features like USB-C, the new type of USB connector, will allow faster charging and also allow you to use your Android phone to charge other devices for the first time. Now, better battery management 
which is also a feature of Android smartwatches, where development continues apace. There's a new black and white mode, which will allow apps to stay open on your watch for longer, as well as a new way of interacting with your watch. So you can, for example, just flick your wrist to scroll through the apps. There were also lots of improvements to other existing Google services. Google Photos has now been given a name of its own and a home of its own, and crucially, unlimited photo and video backup storage through Google, a first and a real swipe there at the likes of Apple and Dropbox. But one of the big themes today was moving beyond simply traditional mobile experiences. Last year at this same conference, Google announced its cardboard headset, which allows users to experience the world in immersive 360 degrees. Well, today they announced that they're going to expand that range of experiences, bringing them, for example, into schools with the likes of expeditions where students and teachers will be able to go on virtual field trips in virtual reality. There's also going to be a new suite of content creation tools. Virtual reality is expected to occupy a big part of the technology world in the next year or two. And as with most other things, it seems Google wants to ensure it's at the forefront. I feel quite exhausted after that. Now, Soweto Fashionery. I bet you didn't know it was going on, but it has been running since Wednesday. It was started just four years ago by the entrepreneur, Stephen Manzini. He was wanting, really, to build an African fashion industry from the ground up, from the local area, from the townships. And an example of a kind of new talent coming through is a young designer with the label Freshwear. He talked to us as he put together the finishing touches to his range. I've been in this business from 2007, yeah, and I'm loving it. It, it was a self-taught thing. I uh, didn't go to school for it. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't go to university because the minute that, that I, I finished school, that's where my mother passed away, and uh, she was prepared to take me to school. I couldn't. Then I was like, let me just continue with my dream. What makes me different? As a designer for fresh wear, it's the pattern that we use and more especially the fabric that we look for when we go and buy material. We don't just go to ordinary stores that we know everyone will go there. We, we look for those hidden stores so that we, we know that we're going to get a, 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 a different element from other designers. This is fresh wear store. That's where I, I, I display almost everything that I design. You get your kitty stuff, men's stuff, some of the stuff here, I'll be showcasing it at Soweto Fashion Week. At least if, if, if you know you're here, you're going to get what you want fitted. Check this, Mitchell. My clients are mainly um, uh, males and kitties. I, sometimes I, I, I try to sacrifice for lady stuff, your fitted suits and so on. On my side, Township fashion is expressing your culture, your inner soul. <laughs> as, a, as a designer, seeing your, your stuff or your range on the ramp is like, I don't know what to say, eh? it's something big. Tonight I'll be showcasing a plus size uh, models range because I've realized well, there's a gap when it comes to plus size uh, models, more especially my clients, because they are complaining or they don't get proper clothes and so on. My feeling for showing at Fashion Week this year, uh, it's a good platform because we know most of us, we get a platform where we can even showcase internationally. It's not a matter of just showcasing at way to Fashion Week and you leave it like that. They're giving you a, a platform, you can even take your stuff and display it internationally and around in our continent. What's next for my brand is seeing myself having a shop in Johannesburg and international. London, the street of London, New York and so on. It's very much exciting. So we're at a fashion week. Let's have a quick look at the markets before we go. Uh, Dow's down, and that's really because of worries about uh, growth in the economy, or lack of growth in the economy, and that shrinkage uh, that we were talking about, even though, in fact, much of it was expected. And that's all from the business edition. Thank you very much for watching. It's been fun. Goodbye.